So I'm going to present you a case of a, a young woman with a complicated history. She's 38 years old, a uh, history of a bicuspid aortic valve. At age 20, had uh, bacterial endocarditis, which required an urgent Ross procedure. And I'll re remind everybody what that is who doesn't deal with this every day. Um, and then at age 28, she had really uh, rapidly progressive aortic root dilation with resultant aortic, aortic insufficiency, and she re required uh, re-op. At that time, she had a composite bentol bioprosthetic AVR and root replacement uh, with a 27-millimeter paramount bioprosthesis. And this, she had a really complicated post-op course with lung injury uh, and hemorrhage and um, uh, really struggled for a couple weeks in the intensive care unit um, but made a full recovery. So just to remind you, the, the Ross procedure is one that's a, uh, used mostly in congenital aortic stenosis, which uh, you take the pulmonary valve as an autograph, put it in the aortic position, and then put uh, some sort of bioprosthesis or conduit in the pulmonary position. Um, so in essence, you're treating one valve disease for two valve disease, and this really becomes important as these patients age. So um, she was followed in our congenital heart disease clinic, and then at age 36, she's developed really progressive exertional dyspnea and exercise intolerance. <laughs> Um, and then uh, presents in really class three heart failure with uh, subject, subjective exertion uh, intolerance, lower extremity swelling, uh, and dyspnea. Despite that, she had a CPET, which was um, remarkably normal for the amount of symptoms she had. So here's her baseline echo, uh, sort of had moderate aortic stenosis, mild aortic insufficiency. You see the um, homograph, the pulmonary homograph has uh, moderate stenosis and moderate insufficiency. So you're stuck here with a patient that has really progressive and severe symptoms, but no objective evidence of severe valvular disease. So the real question is, what do you do next? So she was referred back to the congenital heart surgeons for a redo PVR AVR. She was deemed to be intermediate risk for a double valve replacement on the basis of her prior surgical complications, but she refused surgery uh, based on that and was presented at our multidisciplinary conference. Um, and we thought the best next step is to treat the most severe valve lesion, which is the pulmonary valve. So here's the um, right ventricular angiogram. You see calcified homograph, really typical appearance for, for a homograph that's uh, 10 years old. Um, you see valve leaflets, but uh, um, they're not moving real well, and you see that paramount in the aortic position. So here's the pre-scented right ventricular alpha tract or homograph, and a 22-millimeter ensemble with a melody valve was deployed uh, with a good result. Here's a multi-track catheter in a pulmonary artery. It's just um, really no insufficiency, just that related to the catheter. Uh, and a pretty nice result. So she came back to clinic, and she's still having class 3 heart failure symptoms. So the gradient through the pulmonary valve is acceptable, and now what we see is that her aortic valve gradient with that normal pulmonary valve now has increased, and her aortic valve gradient is actually over 5 meters, um, demonstrating severe aortic stenosis. So the next question is, what do you do with her now? So we elected to proceed with valve and valve TAVR. Um, this was in the Sapien XT era, so she had sort of borderline access vessel around 5 millimeters, so she ended up being a transapical case. Here's the Sapien uh, XT being deployed. This is a 26 millimeter Sapien XT. See the deployment a little bit canted, but the result looks pretty good. Nice stable valve result, no aortic insufficiency, and pretty normal gradients for the prosthesis. So um, she presented at one month after her TAVR, and she noted significant improvement in her dyspnea and fatigue, and she's really just limited by the thoracotomy pain from the transapical TAVR. At six months, she was class one, back to work, riding horses, doing her ranching up in the, up in the high country of Colorado, and feeling really well. Um, and then recently, at a two-year two visit, she remains free of symptoms. So the things that we learned from this case is uh, right side and mixed valve disease have significant hemodynamic impact, which really mimics low flow, low gradient AS um, in patients uh, that otherwise you see small chambers, but it's really on the basis of poor forward flow based on the combined lesions. Uh, and this can happen in the absence of any severe pathology quantitatively by echocardiography. Um, we found that percutaneous valve replacement in these patients with adult congenital heart disease who've had several sternotomies, some of them complicated, can be really used um, in young patients to extend the life of surgically placed conduits, and really a tailored approach is vital. So in conclusion, uh, as we all know, people who take care of patients with congenital heart disease, there's lots of challenges, uh, especially in young folks who've been reoperated on multiple times. And then in addition to mixed valve lesions where you have insufficiency and stenosis, uh, combined right and left sided heart valve disease poses additional diagnostic and therapeutic challenges. Thanks very much. So, so one comment, Dominic, I think that we've used for patients like this the cardiac MR, cardiac MRI, a lot to quantitate regurgitant lesions because my feeling was that you probably, even your angio on your paramount valve, 
you saw a lot more AI than the echo was, was showing mm-hmm. you. And probably this patient was having um, significant PI and AI. Um, so my question for you, and, and I think this is a good strategy because ultimately if they've had six sternotomies by age 21 and they're coming to you for one endo fix, it would have been nice to have been involved in some of that decision making along the way and stagger surgical and endo catheter fix. If you had to do this again and you knew both valves were buggered, would you do it simultaneously or would you still stage it? Um, your, your points are very well taken in, in that I agree that the degree of aortic insufficiency is probably more. Mm-hmm. We, we didn't think the aortic valve was that bad to begin with, which is why we elected to do a transcatheter pulmonary valve first, because we thought that was her main issue. But as you saw, after we fixed the pulmonary valve and her forward flow and cardiac output in, increase, she clearly had severe mm-hmm. aortic stenosis in addition mm-hmm. to aortic insufficiency. So um, had we... We do MRIs routinely in our adult congenital patients. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's a little more challenging with combined lesions. So mm-hmm. I, I, your point is well taken that if we had the quantitative MRI data look at regurgitant fraction and saw that it was more, mm-hmm. I don't think it's unreasonable to, to you know, potentially do these in the same, same city. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But we, we were actually surprised when we saw her in follow-up and her aortic valve gradients were over five meters. So, um, and she didn't improve after the pulmonary valve replacement, which was the most important thing. So we, we thought we can get away with just a PBR mm-hmm. and save that aortic valve for another day, but clearly that didn't happen. Here, yeah. so. And you don't lose anything by staging. Yeah. Thanks. All right, thank you.